Hello, I'm Cam Hall, the head of news here at Raw 1251 AM, and I'm pleased today to be joined by um, Dr. Mike Tildesley, a work university epidemiologist who sits on SPIM, one of the boards advising um, the government as part of its um, coronavirus response. Of course, we've seen a recent resurgence of coronavirus cases around campus and in the local area due to the rise of the Delta variant, alongside um, a lot of discussions concerning increased vaccine uptake, um, of course, the proposed easing of restrictions or the planned easing of restrictions on the 19th of July and plans for term one. So quite a lot for us to discuss today. Um, Dr. Mike Tildesley joins me now. Um, thank you very much for joining me, Dr. Tildesley. No problem at all. Good afternoon. No, it's fantastic um, to have you here again today. So let's start off um, with the Delta variant. Of course, we've seen a significant rise um, in coronavirus cases, as I said earlier, um, within Warwick. Indeed, um, within the Warwick district area, it now has um, on the second, I believe, the second fastest um, growing COVID rate in the West Midlands behind Tamworth. And we've seen cases of COVID um, now reach over 20,000 daily um, from yesterday. Looking at this current um, spike in cases, how far away would you say we are from the peak? Yeah, so that's actually quite difficult to predict. And um, now I will say, you know, this is a different situation from where we were back in October and also in January, you know, when cases were rising in a concerning way. Um, now that we've got really high levels of protection through vaccination, it's not necessarily the case that we're going to see a big wave in hospital admissions and deaths. And it's really important, actually, that when we report cases, we also talk about hospital admissions and deaths alongside that. Um, and we're getting some pretty good evidence that actually the vaccines are playing a really crucial role. We get, we've got very high levels of uptake in younger people, as well as it's being rolled out to younger age groups. So that's really great news. Um, it seems to be things seem to be turning around a little bit in some of the hotspot areas, say in Bolton, which was one of the main hotspots of the Delta variant a few weeks ago. Things seem to be turning over there. So it may be that projecting forward, we may see a peak in cases at some point over the next maybe month or so. The crucial thing is, what are we going to see in terms of hospital emissions? They may rise and indeed they're, they're slightly rising already in some areas, but certainly not at the same scale as earlier on this year or last year. So that, I think, provides hopefully good supporting evidence that we are hopefully on track for further relaxation in a couple of weeks' time. And then it really comes down to what are the government prepared to accept in terms of a rise in hospital emissions once we relax further? No, certainly. And of course, I spoke to you um, previously in February. And as you said, obviously, a very different situation now with the vaccine um, rollout, which is obviously where we have seen this slightly lesser rise in hospitalizations and deaths compared um, to the previous two waves, um, and obviously March 2020 and October 2020. Um, if we think about, obviously you mentioned hospitalizations and deaths, and we've said obviously the numbers are staying low at the moment. If there is still a significant um, rise um, in cases to come, and of course we've still not necessarily um, reached a bit, if cases have gone up quite a lot in the last week, some of these could still turn into hospitalizations. Can we be confident that we're not going to reach similar levels to what we did throughout 2020? I think we can certainly be confident we're not going to reach similar levels as we saw in 2020 in hospital emissions and deaths. Um, I think it's likely that those figures will go up. Um, but at the moment, they're staying very, very low. So I say we're seeing it rising slightly in some areas. Um, and of course, as cases go up, the vaccines are not 100 percent protective. And because of that, some people, even with two doses of the vaccine, will go to hospital. Interestingly, in the data at the moment, um, what we are seeing is a lot of the people that are going to hospital are tending to be slightly younger and also slightly less ill, which is actually quite an, a good sign. It means that perhaps what we're seeing in the hospital emissions data is maybe, you know, we're not really comparing like for like as to what we saw back at the start of the year, that if individuals are being admitted to hospital with slightly less severe symptoms, because, of course, the NHS is not overwhelmed in the way that it was earlier on this year. The majority of those people are recovering. So, again, it's it's not the same situation we we're in earlier this year. I don't think that we're completely out of the woods. And I think we may well see hospital emissions and deaths rise a little bit further over the coming weeks. But I think we do need to sort of put this into perspective in terms of what we saw earlier in the year and what we expect to see now, which should be significantly lower. We'll come back on to vaccinations um, very shortly. But just firstly, um, looking at this current um, spike in cases, um, the government have faced a lot of criticism um, for not potentially putting in measures um, to have stopped the spread of this potentially early, in particular with references um, 
to the border policy and the fact that India was not put on uh, or was judged to be put on the red list too late. Um, looking at a lot of the epidemiological data concerning the Delta variant, um, do you think that this spike in cases could have been prevented with stronger and earlier restrictions from the government? I think it's really difficult because if we look at the situation with the Delta variant in other countries in Europe, you know, they're already starting to be affected by it. So it may have been that um, tougher restrictions could potentially have delayed the Delta variant getting in, but I don't think it would have stopped it altogether. That's very, very difficult to do. So I think the chat, there's all this challenge is always going to be around. We're always going to have <laughs> variants emerging and potentially we're going to have to put mitigations in to try to reduce the risk of those going out of control. I think the key thing is, though, when these variants do emerge, we need to react rapidly domestically. If at some point further down the line, we do get a variant emerging that's evading the vaccine, you know, we need to do rapid tracing. Potentially, at some point, we might have to consider booster vaccines. We've got to do all we can to prevent large waves of infections and hospital admissions occurring in the future. But I think it's really difficult to sort of look back in hindsight and say, we could have put restrictions in earlier because you've always got to trade that off as well with the need to get back to normality. You know, we know that the travel industry has had a really, really difficult last 18 months and we can't shut our borders forever. So at some point, there's got to be a balance of risk there. Yes, hindsight is certainly a wonderful thing when it comes to a lot of um, COVID over the last year. And of course, we talk a lot about um, the return to normality and vaccinations have been really a key part of that and certainly we're recording the interview on um the 29th of june 2021 um the government dashboard just before this interview i checked um just over 77 million doses of the vaccine have been given out including just short of 85 percent of first dose of the population have received the first dose just under 62 percent a second dose and so despite the rising cases this higher uptake in vaccines as we've seen um how much has has it yet broken the link between cases and hospitalizations and if not when can we when would we be able to say that the vaccines have broken that link well i think we're already seeing evidence that they've not necessarily broken that link but they've certainly severely weakened it um, i think the uptake has been absolutely incredible actually i think one of the the way that the vaccine campaign has worked i think you know I, you know, if I can sort of give a bit of an anecdotal situation, you know, I, I look back to um, sort of a year ago and I remember having many conversations with people about, oh, they, they're not going to take the vaccine because they didn't trust it, because it got developed so rapidly and so forth. And now I fast forward 12 months later and those same people who have expressed their reluctance to accept the vaccine have been really, really eager. I think the way that the rollout has happened, the fact that it started in the older and the vulnerable people, as it should do, of course, but because we had such high levels of uptake there, it really filtered down the age groups. And I think that was really, really nice to see. It's been really heartwarming, actually, to see the, you know, the really high levels of uptake in sort of you know, young people, the 18 pluses that have been able to access the vaccine af out of, um, after the last week or so. I think that's been incredible. So what we are seeing, of course, is we're seeing at the moment, as you said, 20,000 plus cases per day. But you know, deaths are still in kind of the low double digits, as it were. So look, last time we had tens of thousands of cases, we were seeing significantly higher number of deaths and hospital admissions to go alongside that. So it's really strong evidence that we are doing much better with the vaccine in terms of helping to sever that link from infection to hospital admission. Yeah, and certainly that um, uptake with the vaccine, and we've seen the severing of the link, has been something that's obviously been very encouraging over the last few years. Of course, it'll be interesting to see how that develops coming in the future weeks, as you said, with this recent spike in cases. Of course, there's a lot of debates at the moment um, concerning future vaccinations. Of course, we have the rollout and with everyone receiving two doses of the vaccine at the moment, but there are debates over whether more doses will be needed, whether potentially um, different vaccines could be mixed and matched. We saw um, German Chancellor Angela Merkel indeed mixed and and matched um, between two doses of um, AstraZeneca and Pfizer when she had her jabs recently. Um, in terms of um, a lot of the talk concerning um, booster vaccines, so we've heard that there may potentially be booster vaccines um, within the autumn. In terms of the sort of epidemiological data that you've seen so far, um, who do you reckon would potentially be likely to receive these doses? And looking perhaps longer term as well, how regular do you see these doses becoming? Well, I think this is a um, this is really a very big question, actually. It's something we do need to think about going forward. So there was some 
Uh, I think there was a statement that came out from uh, Public Health England yesterday that suggested that booster vaccines were not necessary at this point in time, suggesting perhaps that actually we're not seeing waning immunity through, through vaccinated people at the moment. In the longer term, of course, we might expect that immunity will wane. You know, yeah, pretty much any vaccine you will take does not have, you know, does not give you immunity forever. You generally have to go back for repeated vaccination campaigns at some point. So we might expect that this would happen. Um, in the longer term, it really depends what happens in terms of COVID. It may be that we get into more of an influenza-like relationship with COVID, that if we do get kind of the virus mutating and new variants emerging where the vaccines are less effective, we may need to be um, providing booster vaccines to the elderly and the vulnerable as we get into the autumn so that we don't see a big wave of hospital emissions. But I still think at this point in time, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. That said, I think the, the real important thing is we want to get back to normal. And I think if we want to get back to normal, we're going to have to have more of a flu relationship with COVID, which is probably going to involve some kind of repeat vaccination campaign when we get into the high risk months, which tends to be the winter. You know, in the winter, respiratory viruses always tend to spread a lot more. Um, so we might expect that there could be some kind of winter surge, which we may need to manage, not just this year, but in years to come with the targeted vaccination campaign. Well, let's move on now um, to um, obviously just talking about um, a possible winter surge. And we've had warnings where obviously, despite um, obviously a lot of the discussions upon living with COVID and obviously needing to move back to normal and have that sort of flu-like relationship with COVID that um, you've discussed, there have... Um, been a lot of discussions a lot of predictions that we could potentially be set um for a tough winter and um, within the nhs not just from covid but also um from an expected resurgence in winter flu as well of course there's um, a lot of expectation with um immunity potentially down with the spread of flu less last year due to a lot of the lockdowns that took place with covid that that could become more problematic this year so looking ahead to this winter even with obviously the planned easing on july the 19th and um, Sajid Javid speaking in the comments yesterday saying that any easing of restrictions now has to be irreversible. Um, are there any restrictions being contemplated um, for this winter and what criteria um, is being discussed for these restrictions? I mean, I will say I'm not party to any of those decisions that are made. I mean, I'm a, I'm a scientific advisor. I am not a decision maker. So if there are any restrictions being considered for the winter, I, you know, I am not aware of them. Um, I think it's it is right that as we move into the winter, as you've quite rightly said, we had, you know, because of the lockdown restrictions we had in place last year, actually there was an awful lot of, you know, a big reduction in other respiratory infections. So there wasn't really a flu season last year. And because of that, we may be going into this winter without the levels of immunity that we would have previously to influenza, which could cause a larger surge if we have a completely open society. So that is something to consider. I think. This is really the right time as we move hopefully beyond 19th of July and back to kind of domestic freedom, as it were. This is the point when we do need to consider what's going to happen in the winter. Uh, and maybe alongside um, alongside a potentially a booster vaccination campaign for COVID, we really need to start pushing large uptake of vaccinations against seasonal influenza so that we can hopefully try to avoid not only a large wave of influenza in the winter, but hopefully more restrictions. I think the point is we don't want restrictions to come back. We know how damaging they are. And if we don't want that to happen, we really need to act sooner rather than later to try to mitigate the worst effects of respiratory vi uh, viruses as we move into the winter. Certainly from what you've been saying there, that you've really impressed the importance of um, vaccination, not just against COVID, but also um, a lot of the other influenzas that you were talking about there. Um, of course, one of the last things, and there is um, some of the debate going on um, really since um, the first lockdown was instigated in China um, back in January 2020 as to um, the effectiveness of sort of lockdowns and social restrictions as a more potentially regular public health tool. And there have been some people who I know have been discussing on social media um, the potential possibility that um, with more future pressures in the future, there are fears, I think, from um, some politicians and some commentators that um, these sorts of restrictions could become a more regular occurrence, say, to um, be used to relieve winter pressures within the NHS. Do you see that these social restrictions as an effective public health tool going forward? 
I mean, I have to be honest, Cam. I mean, you know, of course, you know, from an epidemiolog from an epidemiologist perspective, of course, they're an effective tool. If you put them in place, they are going to reduce risk. But I find the whole idea that these are being considered potentially, and I, you know, I have no, you know, I have no knowledge that they are being considered. Um, you know, I would find the idea of this really quite scary and potentially dystopian that we're going to move into the idea of these sorts of restrictions could be considered to combat uh, potential winter respiratory viruses. I think that. Um, I mean, we only have to go back to kind of November, December time and how difficult it was for for hospitality, you know, for um, um, for sort of businesses, you know, shopping you know, and sort of look at the situation as we go into November and December with, say, the festive season, the huge damage to um, retail and hospitality over that period. I think this is not something that I would want to get into a cycle of us doing, because I think at some point, we have to clearly, we don't want to be having a thousand deaths per day from a respiratory virus. That is something that absolutely should be avoided. But there are steps we can take to reduce the risk of that with targeted vaccination, with sensible rules in place, such as ensuring that people are supported to be at home when they are sick, rather than kind of encouraging, you know, rather than having a society where it's almost like a badge of honor to drag yourself to the workplace when you feel under the weather. I think these are the little changes that we can make to hopefully mitigate risk moving into the winter that doesn't involve having a large-scale lockdown. Just one last question um, from me now. Looking ahead to Term 1, and um, of course there's a lot of discussions taking place um, with regards to how normal university should be in Term 1. Now, of course, as we said, the restrictions um, are being eased at the moment on July the 19th. That's still the plan from the government at the time of recording. Um, we've seen um, the plans or the preferred approach from the university uh, with regards to teaching next year that Rural News broke a few weeks ago, um, which said that currently any teaching, so lectures over 50 people would continue online in a blended approach. But the hope was um, for in-person seminars to resume. And we're also hoping as well with um, many students hopefully being double jabbed as well. The Students Union um, have said that they are hoping to reopen um, their amenities their facilities including the copper rooms tea bar and all of their um, entertainment facilities hopefully in full come september so looking ahead to term one i guess how if we were to put normal in a sort of inverted commas at the moment how normal should university be in term one it's really difficult i think it's actually probably a little bit early to to make that prediction um i because we don't know necessarily what's going to happen with this future wave and what might be the situation come September. That said, I think it is important that we get universities back to as normal as possible. I think it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, there'll be some students who are going into their third year this coming September, October, who won't have had a sort of inverted commas, a normal year of undergraduate life. And I think it's important that we try to give those students, particularly those who are going into their final year, as normal a year as possible. I think, you know, university is about learning, but it's also about the student experience. And I think it's, you know, I personally find it very sad that an awful lot of students haven't had that experience that many of us a little bit older have been fortunate to experience during our undergraduate life. Clearly, we don't want huge risk associated with that, but I think we need to try and balance those risks with the need to get back to normality and to support our students. And I think the face, some kind of face-to-face -face interactions between students and, of course, between students and staff is really important. Uh, we've had a year where we have had to teach online, and in a sense, in inverted commas, that has worked, but it's not a substitute for direct face-to-face -face teaching. I think the interactions you get between students and lecturers and also between fellow students, you know, conversations that might happen outside the lecture theatre or over coffee, these sorts of things have not been able to happen. So I really hope if not in this first term, maybe toward like as we move through the year, possibly in turn two, we can move back to much more face to face interaction. So I think it's hugely important for the student experience. Well, Dr. Tildesley, as an incoming third year, I don't think you could have spoken to me any better there. Thank you very much um, for your time today. No problem at all. So that was um, Dr. Mike Tildesley, who sits on SPY M, one of the board's advising, um, Sage, of course, who advises government throughout the coronavirus pandemic. Um, as we said, hopefully a lot more content to come like this throughout the next academic year as we hopefully now enjoy the summer. And um, we'll see you back again, back in September for the start of the new, new academic year. But please make sure to follow us on social media um, so you can keep up to date with all of our latest content and all of the exciting announcements that we have for our new content coming next year. But I've been Cam Hall. Thanks very much for watching.
across campus, online, and on 12.51am. This, this, this is your student radio station.